that experience, everyone told me I couldn't. Everyone told me I was a fool. Everyone told me I was, I was an idiot. I wasn't a cowboy. I wasn't capable. I didn't have enough money. I was going to fail. I'm sure you and probably your audience is very familiar with this. I mean, it's Tony Robbins talks about it a lot. Like there, the, the intent was pure. They were just scared for me. All right, welcome to Master Life by Design. I'm excited for today's interview with Chad Corvette. He is located in, well, he's a nomad. And so he'll be sharing more of his cool, epic story as we jump in. But I just want to say, Chad, thank you for being on the show. Welcome and thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm stoked. So, all right, I already said you're kind of a nomad. So why don't you tell everyone kind of like, why are you a nomad? Like what, how did that all come about? And then I'd love for you to just share your story, like your background, so people get to know you. Sure. So I became a nomad really around the age of about 19. So I grew up in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, which is the only radio quiet zone left in the world because we have the world's largest fully movable telescope. So very little industry, very little opportunity, very few people, um, way more bears and humans. <laughs> But I, I grew up there and got, you know, learned the grit and working hard. And anyways, I, I, I went to college uh, for four, three hours from, from where I grew up. The first semester, I found out if you made the dean's list, you could take as many hours above 15 hours. You could take as many hours as you wanted for free. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. So as a freshman, I started carrying between 18 and 24 hours uh, with honors. And I just burned out that first year. I was just, I was taking, I had a heavy class load as a freshman in college, mm -hmm. trying to keep a 4.0. And I thought I was in a city. It was a town of about 30,000 people. Um, I thought that was a city at the time. <laughs> And uh, I was just like, I can't, I gotta, I gotta get away. So I was like, I'm going to go out West to be a cowboy. And I had grown up, you know, I, I started, I bought my first horse, I saved up money and bought my first horse at 12 years old. And uh, had, I, I raised a couple of foals and still have those. I still have a mule on a horse that I raised from when I was in middle school, wow. but I was like, I'm going to be a cowboy. So I started calling ranches, ended up being a, a cowboy on a dude ranch outside of Yellowstone. And uh, that's that really that experience. Everyone told me I couldn't. Everyone told me I was a fool. Everyone told me I was I was an idiot. I wasn't a cowboy. I wasn't capable. I didn't have enough money. I was going to fail. And it was just and, and you're I'm sure you and probably your audience is very familiar with this. I mean, it's Tony Robbins talks about it a lot like there, the the intent was pure. They were just scared for me. And it wasn't that they were trying to hold me back. They were trying to protect me. But paradoxically, they were holding me back but at some something something told me just trust your trust yourself and do it and I did it and after that man like I came the I ended up to make a long story short the cowboy that I worked for I worked for like three weeks I cut timber broke horses you know I built bridges that had washed out like all kinds of just heavy you know heavy labor um, and then at the end of about three or four weeks or at the end of about a month I've been working 1600 days i'm like buck you gotta pay me man he didn't have any money so i got in the jeep and drove all the way from yellowstone back to west virginia and that's where i started a, my first kind of legitimate company at 19 i started a fencing company and come full circle 20 20 years later uh back in november i actually bought bought that property i did the house that i'm rebuilding right now i bought my own damn fence back <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but, but that one trip is what proved to me, like, it doesn't matter what everyone, what everyone else says, who the hell do you want to be? If you want to be a cowboy, go be a cowboy, give it a try. And that just opened me up. So ever since then, I've, I've really, I've had this, this like adventure. If, if I sit still, I just, I, I feel like I, I grow complacent, but when I'm moving and like keeping myself out of my comfort zone and new experiences. So that's pretty much how I've lived my life, but that was the first one. That's what made me a nomad was uh, escaping the big city of 30,000 people to go be a cowboy. <laughs> nice. So I loved what you said is like, if you want to be a go-go cowboy, go, right? The biggest challenge that I see for a lot of people is they don't go try shit, yeah. right? Like they have all these thoughts on, it might be cool to do this, or I might, might want to, but I got this, I got this responsibility, or I can, I got to pay the bills, 
right? And they, they don't go try. And so why was it important for you to go try? What was that? Why was it important for you to go try? I mean, for me, like I needed to, I, I needed, like I've, I've been very independent pretty much my whole life. Like I, I came from amazing parents and an amazing community, but we had a pretty modest lifestyle. We, we hunted or grew probably 90% of our food uh, because we had to. So I had a lot of grit already. I had a lot of independence already. Um, I had started my first little business at like seven years old. Um, but I guess for me, I just needed, like, for me, it was a lot about independence, about proving to myself that I was capable of what I thought I was and being, and being able to control those fears and push those down to try, just try it on for size and see. And I've, I've asked several Tony Robbins coaches and I haven't had a chance to ask him directly, but some prominent psychologists, psychiatrists, and I'm like, how do you know the difference between a dream and bullshit? And in all the high, high level people that I've ever met, the only way to know is to go try. You don't know whether it's a dream or a daydream or complete bullshit until you've had the experience. And I've, I've, I've sat with that for <clears throat> over 15 years now. And that's still the only way I know to separate dreams from bullshit is action. Like mm -hmm. you have to go do it. And then, you know, you get validation, whether you were right or whether it was like, oh, uh, and hopefully being a parent is you're a little bit clear on that because it's hard to realize. <laughs> There's no good turning back. <laughs> being a cowboy, you can get back in the Jeep and drive home. But <laughs> That's awesome. That is so funny. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I, all, I always say, you know, and my, my answer to that would have been like, follow your excitement, but which is the the pre-notion that you have to go do it, right? Like if that excites you, go try, go do it, go attempt it, go experience it. Because that's why, you know, if you look at relationships, that's why you go on dates, right? You don't just say her, I, I'm going to go marry her. Will you marry me? Right? No, you go on dates, explore and see, is this something that you could see long-term and that you enjoy and all that good stuff. So, yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Man. Hey, along those lines, um, so I'm reading a book right now called The Art of Impossible. And I think it's in chapter two, Stephen Kotler, I believe is the author. In chapter two, he, he has an interesting way of helping people extract this um, or to accelerate it. So he recommends like step one, sit down and make a list of your 25 top curiosities. Um, step two, look at that list and see where those curiosities intersect. So do kind of a keep, kill, combine, like, or if they're synonymous, maybe they get combined. But step two is where do those intersect? Step three is commit for 21 days to spend 10 to 20, 20 minutes a day doing something with that. So listening to a podcast, reading a book, talking to a friend, journaling about it, whatever. Um, and this is how he's, he's trying to teach people how to, I don't say cultivate, but really extract, like chisel away everything and get to that, that what your true passion or purpose is. So for anyone like to further to what you said, I mean, that's just a, I think it's the best shortcut that I've ever heard and it's based on neuroscience. Um, but that's, if you feel like, God, I, you know, I'm, I'm already in this mess and all this is going on. I don't even know where I could start. Like you might like try something like that. I thought that was a really neat way to help people discover purpose and passion. Mm, so good. So good. And I've done similar things with clients and I, there's a client I remember worked the desk job and and what we ultimately came down to <clears throat> what really excited him most was being a firefighter and so he went and we had him interview a firefighter and then he went to the firehouse for a few hours with that guy and then he started volunteering and he enjoyed it but then after about six months he was like you know what I thought I really like this but I, I don't like this isn't what I want to do he thought that's what it was and that that's the problem <clears throat> I think sometimes, and it's not a problem, but people will come jump in. They're like, oh, I think I want this and commit. And that happens in college all the time, right? Like, oh, I, I want, I'm going to do finance. I'm a finance major. And then you get into like five finance classes and you're like, this sucks, right? I'm going to go business. It's like, but you know, people commit to jobs without exploring who you're going to work with, where are you working? What is the, the culture like, right? Like they never explore that, try it out, try it on uh, to really understand if they want to commit or not so um very cool all right so 19 business all that where did you go from there 
So I started out training for the FBI at 15 years old. Um, I set my sights. I, I went to West Virginia State Trooper Junior Academy at 15. I had the right letters starting with school. Like I didn't know any politicians um, and I, I wasn't a, a police officer's kid. So I had to do that. They, they were accepting 32 kids in the state in this program. Um, so I went to basketball coach, high school principal, superintendent, up to county commissioner, all the way up to the governor and had the governor write a recommendation letter to the police academy. Wow. And I was like, that was another one of those moments where I'm like, I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go try it. And of course, everyone's like, you're 15. I'm like, that's stupid. You shouldn't like, who wants to go to police academy? Yeah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whatever. And I just, I didn't listen to my friends, my peers. I said to hell with it. And I went for it. So shockingly, I got it. So I went and let them basically abuse me like a <laughs> like a cadet for, I think it was a week or two weeks. But after that, I was like, all right, I'm going to serve. Like that's, this is what I'm doing. So I lift, started lifting weights. I, I shedded weight. I was a fat kid then, but I, I took athletics more seriously, started lifting weights in the off season, training, shooting. Like that was, that was my, my true North all the way from about 15 years old through college. Um, what ultimately ended up happening is uh, two weeks before 9-11, I talked my two best friends into going to the military. And we were going to the Army because they were offering big fat bonuses and weren't, there hasn't been a war in how long. Like we were in third grade last time there was a conflict. <laughs> well, I failed the hearing test. I can't hear 6,000 megahertz. And I failed it nine times. I went through maps nine different times, watched my two buddies swear in, and I was left literally in tears because I wanted to serve. And two weeks later, 9-11 happened and my phone was ringing off the hook and recruiters all of a sudden found a loophole to get me into the military as a cook. Right. And I'm like, nope. So I knew that I couldn't pass the FBI hearing test, but I decided to stay committed to the track that I was on because that that my heart was just screaming so loud. That was my purpose. So I finished up, graduated with honor. Before I graduated, um, I decided to swing for the fence. I applied for an FBI job and they hired me. I signed a contract at 22 years old in March and I graduated in May. Um, and that started a whole bunch of BS. So I was hired on the, the cover page for my application were nine failed hearing tests from MEPS. Um, but they accepted me, wavered me went through all the testing, got top secret clearance, got, you know, signed the contract, did everything. And then uh, a, a year and so in, they said, hey, we got some really good news for you. We're gonna give you a giant pay raise and a desk job. And that was my last day with the FBI, I walked away. And I, on, on principles, I burn it to the ground. Um, that's, that's where life changed for me. Like that's the first time where I was ever uh, like truly uncertain. And I'm 23 years old. Most people don't find certainty until then. I'd been certain since I was an adolescent and I was just lost, man. I was, I was bitter. I was cynical. I was pissed off. Um, so I went and got my real estate license. I looked at my friends who were selling resort real estate at an interwest resort that I grew up near. Um, they were making six figures and a a county with a median income of 18 grand. So I went and got a real estate license. I had the fencing company still going, but I knew that was too hard of work to do for 40 years. Um, so I went into real estate and that's where everything kind of shifted for me. But that's, that was my early path. Like in my, my career, I, I was devastated. I thought life was over and I'm not going to lie. It took me, it took me probably a decade to fully reconcile that and to let it go. Um, and I had to learn that lesson. Like I, I barely had a prefrontal cortex at that age. So it was just starting to develop. Right. So it took me most of my mid twenties and, and into my late twenties to actually reconcile that and go, that's the best damn thing that ever happened to me. Because what I learned in my travels and adventures and, and what comes after that in the story was I'm actually an incredibly empathetic person. And I, I tend to every person that I meet is like another layer that I put on. Like I, I carry those stories with me, good or bad. So I've got to be careful who I associate with, who I spend time with, because I, I just connect with them, whether they're in a, if they're in a bad situation, those layers get heavier and heavier and heavier. So in retrospect, the best thing that ever happened to me was leaving law enforcement because I think ultimately it would have eaten me alive and I would have had a miserable existence because <laughs> I care too much and I, I keep the stories with me they they keep you know um, but ultimately I ended up 
kind of done the same thing again. I took my, got my license in 06, 05. Um, I was told by, you know, the resort, they're like, oh, you're a cop. You can't sell this kind of multi-million dollar real estate. So I started selling land, had 24 closings in my first four months in real estate, had no clue what I was doing, but I was having fun. And I, I led the, the entire company. Uh, and then I got recruited by the resort and I started selling res- ski front, beach front. And that was in 07. I, I didn't understand economics enough to know what was happening, but I saw the writing on the walls. I saw everybody trying to list their condo at the same time and people desperately lowering prices. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. So I looked for uh, a development that was, you know, more cash flow oriented. And I found out about indoor water park resorts. I thought, who the hell would go to an indoor water park? I uh, drove to Wisconsin Dells, met these guys, and, and we ended up taking that listing. So I moved to Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee, and we pre-sold an indoor water park that's, that's still there. Um, and then 2008 set in on us. So the preferred lenders decided to run away and just leave us and the buyers high and dry. The buyers had 20% cash deposits, and they were going to lose them. The developer was going to go bankrupt. So at, at this point, I was 25 years old, and I'm like, what am I going to do? So selfishly, I wanted to get paid. I had like 75, 80 grand in pending commissions that wouldn't get paid if they didn't close. So I went to the community banks and sat in the lobby, and I said, I'm here to see the president. They said, do you have an appointment? I said, nope, but I have all day. And in two days, I raised $42 million in community bank capital. And then I took that back to the developer and, uh, and to the broker. And I said, hey, we need to talk about salary. So uh, we negotiated for me to, to basically switch roles from sales into uh, managing closings, which we'd never had to do. And that ultimately resulted in me moving to Seattle where I could cover six time zones. Um, and I managed, I was one of three people on a, on a team that we built. Uh, we managed a billion dollars worth of pre-construction real estate sales through the crisis, got all the buildings closed. And um, when the smoke started to clear, I went ahead yeah. and got fourth real estate license and uh, I moved to Maui in 2008. Um, and then there I sold leftover inventory, lived on an island, making hot, you know, making a very, very good living more than I ever thought I was capable of living on Kanapali beach, working a few hours a day, having nothing to do, but surf and free dive. And, um, it eventually three years in, I got to a point where by all measure in the outside world, I, I, I was, I looked like a success, but I wasn't fulfilled. My heart was screaming at me. Hey dude. This, this isn't you. Like, what the hell are you doing? Like, when I had time, I would escape into like up above Pai, like up, up into the up country of Maui in the redwood forest. And I would hunt pigs in the jungle when I rode motorcycles and mountain bikes. And I camped up there. And I was like, I was doing things on Maui that I wanted to be doing in the Rockies and the Appalachians and the Cascades. Um, and I just, even though the money was there, the, 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 everything was comfortable but I wasn't. Um, so I struggled with that for the better part of like 10 months. I knew that I needed to leave. I just kept hitting the next sale, which would put me out 60 or 90 days and another sale. And these are multi-million dollar sales. So they're big paydays. Yeah. Um, and eventually <laughs> Like I had, I had booked a shipping container and I just kept calling maps and I'm kicking it out. I'm like, Nope, give me another couple of months, another couple of months. And I wasn't really being true to myself because of money. And it's, it's, you know, we can allow money to control us in a good way in, in, in several ways. Um, I'll say that's on the negative side. I was allowing money to, to control the lifestyle I lived. Like I was tolerating that to get more money. And I don't know, one morning I just kind of woke mm. up to that fact and I, I released it and I'm like, okay, this is out of my hands. This is, this is out to the universe. Whatever's supposed to be for me will happen today. So I went in that morning, I sold $2.4 million worth of condos before lunch. And when I came in, my director of sales was crying her eyes out. Um, I had to play good cop, bad cop because a homeowner wasn't going to close on a $750,000 deal. And I just said, you know, listen, man, I, I know this whole process has been a little half-assed. I promise it won't be after you close. It's going to be a great experience. And because I, I, just, I did that, got the deal closed successfully, the developer decided that, and in, in retrospect, like I just thought about that morning, I'm like, I know why this is happening. 
So they they exercise their right to sever the, the you know the the contractor relationship with me and I just smiled and I was like I was like you know the last day of school kicking the doors open on a five star resort like I'm free. <laughs> uh, I immediately went home. I called Matt and I'm like, hey, you know that container we've been moving out? Get it here. And I started loading that day, packed my stuff into a Connex and and put it two weeks out ahead of me and. Uh, that was that was my reset. I was 29 years old at the time. I knew I had been talking to gym franchises, lawn care franchises, food franchises, uh, looking at convenience stores, wine stores. I, I was just exploring anything and everything. Like I knew by that point, I had a good. I was getting. I gave myself an Amazon MBA, and I had a good understanding of what was happening economically, and that there was a lot of opportunity ahead. But I couldn't. I didn't know what that was. So. Um, you let me know if, if, if you have yeah, questions. Good. <clears throat> this is great stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I loaded my, I spent the next 12 days just taking one last trip around the rock, doing the best of everything Maui has to offer. And I went to stay with my, one of my best friends in the world. He's now 83 years old. He's an old hippie in Washington. He's lived off grid for 40 years. Wow. And, uh, just one of my favorite humans ever so I went and he's one of those people you just want to be around when you need to be recentered when you need to be grounded he's the person you want to be around because he you know no bullshit he'll tell you how it is he'll listen to you so that was where I wanted to go um so I went there uh within a few weeks I decided I threw this picture on the wall represents uh, uh it's there for a reason to remind me um very relevant to this conversation so I very underprepared, had a Suzuki motorcycle. I threw a backpack on the back of it. No panniers, no, none of the safety gear and all the fancy stuff that I have now. But I, I had not fly fished in years and I wanted to reconnect with that. I, I took a, a leather bound journal, a fly rod, some freeze dried food and a motorcycle and a camera uh, and I took off. So no cell phone, no GPS, no, no distractions. And I lived in the Canadian wilderness of British Columbia and Alberta for a couple of months. And I would ride 10 to 12 hours a day, take photos. At night, I would roll into camp, cook my freeze dried meal and fly fish on the lake or the river in front of me. And I was just being present for the first time. I wasn't responding to a phone going ding or an email inbox or, you know, this or that. I was, I was isolated because I wanted to be. And for the first time ever, I... I just, it was quiet. Like I, I was, it was just me and Chad. Right. And near the end of that trip one night on, in Fernie, British Columbia, um, there's a place called Hartley Lake. And I had found that this side road and I'd ridden up there by myself, and, you know, beautiful evening. And I just, as it was like the loudest that, you, that I've ever heard something, it's, it's, it just came to me not like, Hey, Chad, you're going to be, you know, this, but some really broad, uh, principles were on my mind and just just kept coming to me that night it was one was help others more than yourself two is net six figures so you can live and give the way you want and three is make sure whatever it is can be ran from an iphone anywhere in the world so you can have this feeling on demand and there was this i don't know just like this washover of peace i'm like okay everything's gonna be fine like you're you're a smart dude you're like whatever I do has to fit those three things going forward. I don't have to know what that is right now. And I let go of it. And that was another one of those big lessons, like learning to trust your intuition and let go has really served me well. So I came back to what I came back into Washington, flew my dad out from West Virginia, which he had never been anywhere. Like he never traveled. Um, and me, my dad, and my dog spent the next two months doing a national park tour. We went to almost every national park in the United States and camped, just a boy, his dog, and his dad. Um, and that was the trip of his lifetime. Like, he, he died talking about it. Um, that also really kind of changed me. I realized how little I actually need to be happy. I, I realized how happy I could be with so little shit. Like I was living out of a backpack practically um, for an, the better part of a year. And it was one of the best years of my life. Like I met amazing people. I had amazing experiences. I've got awesome photos. I had these epiphanies that have helped me reach so many other people and help them, you know, discover the version of their story that they enjoy telling instead of what they were living. 
So it was, it was such a gift, but one of the big gifts in that was realizing how little it actually takes to make you happy and how a lot of times, especially in that scenario, the more stuff you have, the more baggage, the more physical belongings, the more <clears throat> tasks that you're managing in your head, the less quality of life you're going to have. Um, and that was a really valuable lesson from that, that summer, spring, summer, and fall. But uh, I came back, that was in 2011, and I decided it took me about three weeks to form my first company. And I decided I was going to be, I came to Roanoke, Virginia, it was a market I had from Maui, I had been looking at like Knoxville, Asheville, Roanoke, Harrisonburg, and Winchester. I had a very specific criteria. I wanted to be closer to where I grew up. I wanted to be 30 minutes from a national forest to be able to get, you know, out into the quiet, have low cost of living, low crime, and high opportunity in real estate. Roanoke won out based on all those, those metrics and uh, knew nobody here, but I, I came down here to a real estate investors meeting, didn't know what that was. Um, and I was in brokerage my whole career and I met some guys and that just, boom, my mind opened. So I formed uh, my very first company on November 13th of 2011 and uh, moved here on January 12th of 2012 and started wholesaling real estate. And I absolutely hated it. That's where I discovered that I was an empath because these people had, you know, they had made a series of decisions or, or not made decisions that led them to a financial crisis. And the only asset they had that was worth anything was the house they were living in. And they called saying, I need to sell my house fast. Well, I had spent my whole career negotiating the price up on millionaires and billionaires. Now I've put myself in a position where I'm negotiating the price down on someone who this is all they have. And that violated rule number one, right? Help others more than yourself. And it just didn't sit right with me. And I, I wholesale houses still, there's a place for it, but I was using it as a predominant strategy. And I was trying to force that as a solution on people who it wasn't the best solution for. So I did a few of those deals and quickly said, this is, isn't for me. Um, started doing a, a, I started a lease option program with a 95% close rate. Um, did owner fine, like a lot of creative financing because lending was still pretty tight and buyers still had a lot of damaged credit and sellers still had suppressed prices. So I was able to push prices, get renters into being homeowners and make a living for myself by connecting the dots for those people um, that were being told by everyone, everyone else, they couldn't be helped. They needed to be renters. That was really good for my heart, not good for my lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm to do it, to get a 95% success rate with lease options, you have, to, you have to be a tough underwriter. You have to be a coach. You have to keep these people moving forward on their credit repair. And it was just not, for me, it violated uh, the other two rules. Like, uh, I mean, it violated the third rule, be able to run it from an iPhone. And like, I, I didn't have geographic independence. I couldn't do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. So I put that down. I quit, you know, started wholesaling, quit, started creative financing, quit, decided to get another real estate license, got my Virginia license, started doing brokerage, like short sales. Uh, that was a hell of a lot of work. Quit, start, did really good, did like 18 or 20 short sales and then said, oh, okay, now I know how to do it. And I put that down and quit. This is the first time in my life I've been a quitter. Like I'm learning to quit at this point. I really sucked at it and it was hard for me. It still is, but I'm getting better at it. There you go. I kept, I kept passing things through that filter. Like, does it meet these three rules? Does it, is it in alignment with the man, like with the person I said I was going to become? And eventually that led to uh, um, on a one appointment. I, I was in this house and I'm getting ready to make videos there this week. This was uh, what, 14 years, 13, 12 years ago. Um, I, I got a call from a lady who, well, whose father had passed away. She was the power of attorney for her mother. Her mother had inherited the house from her husband. She had a massive stroke, was in ICU, and they were trying to discharge her, but she had no long-term care insurance. Um, I wanted the house. It was in the neighborhood I was renting in. I'd moved, I'd, you know, chose that neighborhood all the way from Maui. Went over, sat down with her, or we took a walk through the house. And for the first time in my life, um, I don't know where this really came from. It wasn't planned, but all those things that I had learned and tried and quit proven and then quit, they all came together and converged on me in one living room in a moment that I didn't expect. 
And I gave this woman four options. Option one was a cash offer close within two or three days. I'll pull some strings to get title done quickly. And she flinched like she needed as much money as she could get and as fast as she could get it. Option two is an as is where is sale, more money, a little bit more time. Option three was we liquidate the personal property in the house, use that for a cosmetic rehab, and then we go to the conventional market at a higher, higher number. And then option four was everything in option three, but we do it using creative financing. And she lit up like a Christmas tree. So I was able to get her 11,000 bucks on the spot. I got four buyers who were fighting over the house, turned three into conventional buyers, turned one into the buyer of that house. And I got home that evening and instead of beating myself up, like I had for being a quitter, for being, you know, for, for not knowing, not having clarity, not knowing what I'm supposed to do with my career. That evening was different. I remember I sat on the back step. It was a spring about this time of year. And I poured a glass of Cabernet and I sat there and thought about it. Like I was very introspective that evening and that changed everything because I said, how many people, if I put others if I put others' interest before my own, if I'm empathetic to the position they're in and put their best interest out in front of my own, can I rep replicate this and, and get this result every time? And that's pretty much how I've lived my life ever since that day. Um, I have, I've trained hundreds of thousands of real estate professionals in the probate space. Um, I teach them to create a valuable offer for the families like that's actually valuable, things that they actually need. Um, how to wrap that into a social or like a vertically integrated solution, I present it as a social enterprise, not as I'm a realtor, I'm an investor to earn the conversation with the family. So you provide value first, you help them with anything that anything and everything. And then in return, you'll be rewarded with the real estate business. And that has, I've had the privilege of becoming a teacher. I didn't realize that's what ultimately where I was headed as I wasn't an investor. I wasn't a realtor. I wasn't a transaction engineer. What, what really called me, what ultimately where I've, I, as far as I've made it in this story so far, is I realized I'm a teacher and I, I can help, you know, I can take what I had figured out and reach hundreds of thousands of families in that end of life transition period where I was only reaching a few dozen a year here. Mm -hmm. so that's what I've been doing lately like that whole story was just a series of try it and it when it when it not if it it doesn't feel right but when for me when it didn't feel right I learned to quit I learned to walk away I learned to do what my heart thought was right for me um and I I could you know I could tell that story as a, a series of failures and falling on my face but just like I said it all converted on me in that one living room all those failures, all those things that I beat myself up about for months and months, they came together and clicked into place into what now is literally a movement. We have communities like I offer a certified probate expert designation. I've, I've certified thousands of people, attorneys, real estate investors, brokers, agents, and like hundreds of thousands of families had a much different experience in, in the end of life transition just because I was willing to quit and I was willing to fall on my face. So mm. it's a long winded story, but I think there's a lot of examples in there of like, be willing to try something, be willing to quit that, give yourself permission to quit. There's value to it. There's value to every failure. Yeah, it's so good. What an awesome story. Thank you for sharing. And, and you're right. You could have said it as a series of failures, but like you said, it all comes to a spearhead. And we never know, you know, my belief system, you know, I believe, you know, God's ultimately in control, whatever. Um, but you never know what those failures are preparing you for, right? And, and who you're becoming or, or who you can help, right? Like your number one rule, right? And so it's like, sometimes we have to go through those things to become someone even greater, but people, they don't like that. They don't like the the thought of being a quitter they don't like to feel uncomfortable right and so they they'd rather stay where they are versus saying what i would say to anyone who's listening who just identified with that statement you should examine that if you say i'm not a quitter you should go deeper follow that back to its root um what you're going to find is it's rooted deeply in your ego and it's not serving you it's it's there to protect you but it's not serving you it's how you end up 65 years old, broken down saying, well, I should have, I, I would have, and you wasted a life. So if you're feeling that, 
like follow it to the source. It's usually ego. And if you're not like, and not in like in that, and I mean it in, in a, in a, in a true traditional psychological sense, like the ego, like that sense of self that defends who you, the stories you've used to build yourself. We, we, we readily defend that, right? Like, well, wait, that's me. That's Chad. I can, I, he, he, I'm right. You're wrong. So anything that challenges us, but what's really interesting about the highest performers and what has allowed me to really grow as, as a person is, is paying attention to that. The people who don't make excuses, the people that don't have their failure story, the ones that tell a story of failure as a lesson of success, like they're, they're managing their ego in a very, very different way than people who are getting a different result or telling a different story. So if you identify with that, if you're afraid to make a change, if you're afraid to be known as a quitter, you're afraid this or that, you know, even, even in, in a relationship, if you know you're headed for a divorce and you're still living with a roommate who you, you're married to, you got to like, that's, that, that's just a really profound example. It's scary as hell. Your identity is wrapped up in that relationship and that person and your ego is going to tell you, no, don't people, people will outcast you but it's usually not true. It's just that ego hanging on to what's comfortable. And even though it's not comfortable anymore, you wake up every morning and can't look her in the eye. And I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of men do that. And it's, it's I try to just kick them out of their comfort zone and be like, move on, dude. <laughs> but if, <laughs> like if you find yourself doing that, and I, no, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. We all are, none of us are perfect. But the thing that's really helped me live a really full life and um, I'm 40 years old now and I've, I've traveled the world and I've, I've, I'm, you know, we haven't talked about all the other stuff. I do adventure photography, philanthropy. I train people to ride motorcycles. I ride motorcycles through developing countries to do photography and clean water projects. Uh, you know, I, I've got a lot of, a lot of hobbies, but had I fallen prey to some of the, the ways of thinking that other people <clears throat> told me I, the way I should be thinking, the way I should be making decisions, I would have had a hell of a different result. Um, I, I would be, you know, in, in, I would have a much different life than I do now. Uh, so anyway, this is something I, sorry to run over. Um, <laughs> no, you're good. I'm very passionate about getting people out of their own way. If, if you feel that little inkling that something's not right, follow that to its source, identify what's holding you back. But almost always it's, it's a, it's a negative belief rooted in your ego and all you have to do is change that and tony robbins is a great a great person to help you to create fast change like the the teachings that he's left us with very very rapid practical psychology but whoever your favorite guru is can help you with it but i, I pay attention when you when you feel those little tinges of 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 intuition it's, it's really a scream deep down in there. If you go deep enough inside, you'll hear it that louder and louder and louder, but you have to be introspective and find where that little voice is coming <clears> from <throat> to feed it. And you know, you'll have a, a very different life if you do that. Absolutely. I like to share with a lot of people that, in the, and you said, you said this quite a few times around listening to your intuition. Um, I, I find, and you can tell me your thoughts on this, I find that we're so busy nowadays and so distracted. It's so hard to hear your intuition, to really know that voice and to hear it. And I always like to say, it's like all the answers are at the bottom of the pond, but you're so busy splashing with your day-to-day -day crap that you, it, the water's all murky, right? Like and you have to wait till it settles. That's why I love meditation. It's like it settles everything. And that's where it opens a channel for you to really get to, to know and to date your intuition, to really understand what your intuition is and to hear it clearly. And so do you, uh, does that land for you? Do you, do you agree? And also, how did you, for you, how did you learn to listen to your intuition? Um, yes, I, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I'm trying to think where, where the first lesson would have been, I, I guess, you know, all the way back to being at six or seven year old being told I couldn't do these things. Like I, I had a business picking up beer cans out of a ditch, selling every other, I, I noticed at the grocery store, we would go to the store once a week. It was like, you know, an hour loop to do that. Um, but there was a guy there every other week that would buy aluminum cans and deer hides. 
and everyone at home just you know all the hunters would come in there from other places and they would throw their deer hides over the hill and leave and they just went to waste and the same with beer cans dumbasses threw beer cans out the window so at seven i was like the hell with it i just went ahead and did it i started collecting cans i took trash bags out of the house and I got my, I used the can money to buy salt from the feed store, got my dad to drive me around and we collected hides from all those people. I was told that I shouldn't have a bank account. I was told that I was too young to be working. I was told that I shouldn't have a business. I was told all this stuff, but I like, there was something in there. Like I felt like I was different and I'm like, no, they just don't understand. They don't understand what, what's going on inside of me. They're trying to help me. And I, I guess that's where I started to follow it. But over time, I've tried lots of different things. Like one of the one of the best things that have really helped me kind of uncover that and chip away all the layers of bullshit stories that we make up that, that makes up ourself is journaling and not based on any traditional journaling habit. Like you have to let it develop it yourself. But for me, I try to, I just write directly to myself. So there's some, there's something powerful about written communication with your inner self. A lot of the bullshit gets flushed out and you'll, you'll surprise yourself how honest you'll be with yourself when you're doing this. Um, but for me with like, you know, meditation, I find to be very difficult. Like I understand it and I can force myself to do it. I've ever, yet to ever get to a point where it didn't feel like it was a forced exercise. So I've given myself, I've shown myself the grace to try different things. So for me, it's walks outside, mm -hmm. um, it's hunting or fishing, like those things where I feel connected with nature and, and, and at peace. Um, other things are like extreme, like, you know, downhill mountain biking or riding a 600 pound adventure motorcycle where most guys ride dirt bikes. And it just, it leaves nothing, it leaves no room for any ancillary thoughts. You have to be 100% present in the moment and be like, be tapped into you. But with journaling, I'll oftentimes will sit down and I actually, you know, my, my mother is recently widowed and I'm helping her through some of this, you know, I'm trying to help her and I'm like, you know, sit down and really like one of the exercises and actually this i'm betting this is a mutual friend of ours shashin shah i'll give shashin oh yeah i know shashin. so shashin challenged me one time to sit down and write a letter to myself like uh, like 2025 chad to 2020 chad and i think that's a very powerful exercise if you're struggling to get in touch with that like it's it's that's one way that you, that i've found you can really discover who you are because um, a lot of us, you know, you've got your friends, you've got your hobbies, like you, these become parts of an identity. And I've seen people who have tried to, you know, who set their sights on financial independence, but they were in fantasy football clubs and they were, you know, in this bar scene and they never could get out. They were trapped in their own damn social situation. They couldn't actually achieve what they wanted to achieve because they kept getting drugged, the crabs in the bucket fallacy, right? And it, like, so for me, I, I, I've, that, that was a really powerful exercise. Who are you in five years? What food do you eat at what time of the day? What people do you have, do you spend your time with? Where do you get your hair cut? Like no matter how small things, it makes it more real. Like envision that. How do you treat the women in your life? How do you treat your kids? How do you treat your, your best friends? Like how present are you? How much free time do you have? Get detailed and then get in the mindset of that person and write yourself today a letter and explain how the hell you got there. It is amazing what will come out of you. You will start to wire together the connection, like the, the map that it takes to become that man you'll be forced in kind of a fun way. You'll be forced to imagine the path that it would have taken to get from A to B. It's going to be different in real life. Like it's, a, it's, it won't look like that at all, but this is an exercise to get you connecting A where you are today with B who you want to be tomorrow or next de the next decade. And so Shashin taught me that. And I think that's one of the quickest ways to accomplish that, that to clear your mind and really focus on where your intuition is leading you. I think that's one of the, the best shortcuts I've ever heard. That's amazing. It's such a such an, uh, a powerful strategy to really help you with that and really go deeper. And the reason is because most of the time I found people just generalize, 
like what they want and that it's so hard. And I share with clients all the time, if you're sitting at a restaurant and a waiter or waitress says, hey, what would you like to eat? And you say food, you're more than likely not going to get what you truly intently want from that, you know, from the kitchen. But when you're really specific and you, you, you write that down, like you said, and that path, yeah, it, it might not come out the way you want, it, the way you think it's going to happen, but you'll still get that end result. It's so powerful, right? So I have a, I have a game that I play. Um, I had never even heard of the secret until New Year's Day of 2012, when I was just getting ready to move to Roanoke. I sat down and read it cover to cover in about, I don't know, what's it take two hours maybe? It was, you know, it's a pretty simple read, but I, the next morning I came back to Roanoke the day after New Year's, I got up at five o'clock in the morning, the gym parking lot was always full. And I literally manifested the parking spot in front of the damn door. Like literally it was about 10 degrees that morning. And I'm like, before I got in the truck, I'm like, okay, I envisioned that spot. I pulled in, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's not that powerful. The backup lights came on, a car backed out and pulled out and I literally pulled into the spot. I have a journal, <laughs> I have a journal about this. And I was like, no way. So I started playing with creation and, and being more deliberate. Um, I read a book called, I think it was uh, Timothy Dooley. No, it was Dr. Robert, um, uh, you have to back me up. It might have been Robert Anthony, Dr. Robert Anthony. It was called The Art of Deliberate Creation. And that was a more scientific look at this. And I went down that rabbit hole and I started that introduced me to quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And I started to look at the world in a whole different way. Um, that's the geek side of the story. The oh, yeah. fun part of the story is I have made a game of this. And everyone who knows me makes fun of like the deals that I come up with, the way I shop. The camper that I live in is called FDR um, because over time I manifested that. Once I get 100% clear on very specifically what I want, um, then I let go of it. I put it out there and it comes back to me at no less than a 30% discount. So I bought an $85,000 camper for 45,000 bucks in perfect condition. I've done this with I've done it with class A RVs, fifth wheels, boats, bicycles, cars. I, I do it with, with clothes. I'm picking up a couch this week. It is the most beautiful work of art you've ever seen in your life. I'm just rebuilding a house. And for the first time ever, I'm learning to let go of money. I've been really good at collecting it. I really suck at letting it go. <laughs> but this is a $20,000 custom leather couch, one of a kind, only one ever made. I've got them down to $6,500. Um, so there, like you can have fun with this. this. This stuff doesn't always have to be work. But for me, like once I realized the more, and, and I went to Tony Robbins UPW the first time in 2013, didn't even know who the hell Tony Robbins was. And I'm a huge, huge fan of his work and, and really don't know how I made it that far without discovering him. But I walked on fire the first time and it felt like, to me, it felt like cold, like wet button mushrooms under my feet. And I was just like, holy crap. But I didn't realize until three years later when I went back to UPW, what an impact that had. But the one thing that really stood out to me most in that very intense four days was you get what you fucking tolerate. Yeah. And that statement hit me. And I started to think about everything that way. Like, am I willing to tolerate this? So if you have a job you hate, remember you chose that and you're tolerating that. You make that choice every morning and you can make excuses. Your ego wants to, oh no, but I have kids and I got bills, but bullshit. You're tolerating it. If it were painful enough, or if there were something that had a high enough reward, you wouldn't be tolerating it anymore. So what I'm talking about in getting deliberate, we'll just stick with that example. You have a job that you think you're stuck in. You don't enjoy it. You decide to tolerate it every morning, every day after you come back from lunch, every time you pick up the phone, you're tolerating something that's not serving you. Like if you can quiet the stories, quiet the excuses, get rid of the, you know, take off the victim glasses and really just focus on exactly what is it that you're willing to tolerate? Exactly. What level of pay, what level of respect, what work hours, what location, like what exactly will you tolerate? 
if you can get clear on that, in my experience, anytime that I force myself to do what I'm telling you to do, shut up all those little voices and, and quit listening to every, everything outside. When I do this and I get 100% clear, change happens almost immediately and effortlessly. And it's, it's fascinating how it happens. Um, but, and, and I know that that might sound like a little, like I, I've, I've played with this a lot. I've tried it. I've tried it with mild intensity. I've tried it with high intensity. It doesn't seem to really matter that much, like how, how bad you want it. Like it's what, what for me, if I follow my intuition, I determine exactly what it is that, that I want. And then I release that. Then it usually just happens for me. Um, and usually in short order, sometimes it'll take six months. Um, and the first time I watched this, the movie, The Secret, after reading the book, I thought, what a bunch of bullshit. And I, if you can calm that, that voice, that ego voice that, that's, that's saying that bullshit, if you can calm that down and actually get quiet, as, as Joe was saying, like find that quiet space and, and really say, you know, what is it that, that, that I really want, which I, I, it's hard to believe how difficult that is. Like in today's world, like we, we can, we have so much in front of us. We could have almost anything, but deciding what we want is one of the hardest things. And some people never figured out until they're on their deathbed. And if you've never done this, I would encourage you to talk to hospice workers and read the books that are written by hospice workers. It'll change the way you live your life. Yeah, that's really good. Which leads me to our last question. Speaking of books, what's one of the most impactful books for you and why? That's a really difficult question for me. Um, so between about, I don't know, 09 and 14, I was reading about 100 books a year. Um, I was trying to get through at least two a week. There's so many. I keep an audiobook library of like in categories. Um, not an easy question it, it's it's really hard for me man i know I'm, I'm complicating the answer um okay it's it's difficult because i have so many it's like me trying to pick my favorite person that's difficult for me too because I, I have so much value on so many um i would say this if if i have a reading list i the way i approach this is when people ask me similar in one-on-one -on -one relationships i say let me know what what change you're looking for or what you're trying to solve and then i'll make a suggestion um, i'm really fortunate to somehow books like put themselves in this chronological order in my head and i can usually go oh i know the one you need to read um, but I, I guess in, in the context of this conversation, I could, I could probably give the secret credit um, for being the first step in that, that discovery and giving myself permission to actually explore an alternative to what I, to what I had been conditioned to believe. Mm, that's so good. My wife, my wife was, um, <clears throat> my wife was actually dating someone for 14 years and the relationship was going straight and she honestly was thinking about her and her boyfriend at the time like and we shared this on our podcast so she she gives me permission but she thought about doing porn with him and she went to go to a psychic at the time and the psychic said you're about to do something so dark that is not part of your path and she knew exactly what it was and she's like and the lady said i want you to go watch the secret every day for 30 days <laughs> so she did and it changed her entire life and i'm ultimately grateful too <laughs> right but um it definitely impactful and i didn't read the book i watched the movie i understand the concept of study it i i, I too like dr joe dispenza um he brings the yeah. science behind the quantum kind of part of it all and he makes it very digestible too in layman's terms for the most part um but at the same time um that movie when he when they depict the thoughts and the emotion going out it's like that wavering going and hovering out and that's what i picture when i think about getting kind of aligning with what i want and releasing it but feeling the feelings of what it's like to have that but detach from it right and i love wayne dyer's book uh detaching or detachment and so um i want to say 
thank you very much. You just dropped a massive knowledge bomb for this last hour for everyone. And for those of you that are watching, you might need to go back and watch this again. There was so much gold and and not just in the things that Chad shared and the, the aspects of like the ego, but also along his journey. And most of us think he's just telling his story, but there's so many lessons and nuggets in there that I, my hallucination is you all can relate to in some way, shape or form. And the biggest thing, Chad, I will say that I think I took away from this is really, are you, are you listening to your intuition and what are you tolerating? And I think so many of us in today's society, because of social conditioning of who they think they should be, they never take time to get clear on who that is and then to figure out what are they tolerating and make the hard, difficult changes. And you have, you did, and that's why you're living the life you have. You have the experiences and the hobbies and the contribution that you do. And that's really inspiring. So I just want to say thank you for, for dropping the knowledge bomb on people. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity. I, uh, I I find myself doing this more and more and more in everyday <clears throat> life. Like I I get into servers and bartenders and anyone who will open, I'll pour myself into because I've seen how the the people that I've had the privilege of mentoring have just accomplished amazing things that they they surprised themselves. And I I remember going through it and I remember that feeling like, like, oh, I could never have a million dollars. It's a joke, right? Like you you pass a million bucks and you're like, well, shit, that was kind of like earning $10 when I was a little kid. And it's so much easier than it seems when you're in your own head, listening to your own ego. And I, I will take every opportunity that I can to make that an easier path for as many people as I can. So thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Before we wrap up, for those that might be in, interested in like the probate business or just, you know, finding out more about you or connecting with you, how can people stay in touch with you? So my new company is called the Magnum Opus Project. Um, the, that you can go to magnumopusproject.com. That site's just now being started. Uh, the course that I'm currently offering is called Probate Mastery, and that's at probatemastery.com. I am on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all the places that I look at whenever I remember to. But you can email support at Magnum Opus Project or support at probatemastery.com and my team can find me um, or you can try to find me on. Uh, we can, Joe, I can give you links to my LinkedIn and Facebook. That's the two that I'm usually on the most. Beautiful. Well, we will get those in the show notes. Once again, Chad, thank you for today. And if anyone wants to get in touch with Chad and, you know, join his probate mastery or, or just follow him, you guys can click the links below and be able to get in touch with him. So again, Chad, thank you so much. And we appreciate you having you on the show. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. See you guys.